Good morning. Come on in and find a seat. We are glad you're here to worship with us this morning. Excited you're here. Excited for what God is going to teach us this morning, what we're going to learn, how we're going to be encouraged by one another. So if you would grab a seat, we would be ex- we'll get, get going here. Um, if you're here for the first time, we would like to invite you to uh, fill out the card that's in the bulletin. That will let us know a little bit about you and be able to share some information about who we are as a church with you. So fill that out. And also that card can be used if you have a prayer request you would like to share with us. Uh, please let us know on that card so that we can be praying for you through the week. Okay? Now a few things I want to let you know about. Um, one is that on Friday night, uh, there was a pajama party here where our ladies, we had um, about 30 ladies that came together and really the whole spectrum from more mature to younger. Is that a good way to say that? Um, so it was a really good time. Um, and they, I heard it was a good time. They, I wasn't invited, but um, so we're excited that they got to do that. And um, we're excited with that. A couple things I do want to let you know about coming up is one, uh, our trivia night is coming up on March 22nd. <laughs> The youth are excited about this. They'll be doing a lot to prepare for this. This is a fundraiser for them um, to be able to go to camp. Uh, Camp can be an amazing time for a youth, um, but it is getting more and more expensive every year. So this is something that they put on. And if you want some more information about that, uh, you can find that at the Connection Center. But we would love to invite you to come and be a part of that night to support them, um, to raise some money for them, but really just have a lot of fun together as a church. Okay? The next thing I want to let you know about is that that um, Noel Paredes um, and some other folks, Kathy Har and Judy Maccabee, have been talking about the um, importance of mentoring young believers, and especially our, our youth and young adults and that kind of thing. So they're putting together a mentoring program. If you would be interested in possibly being a mentor, we would like to invite you to an infor- informational meeting on March 17th, right after church, and there'll be a light lunch provided. So if you're just thinking, hey, that might be something I'm interested in doing, please come on March 17th. And if it's something you think you would like to do, then there will be some trainings in the three weeks following that, okay? So that's a mentoring training on March uh, 17th. And then I want to also let you know that um, we have a ministry called Stevens Ministry, and their um, desire is just to walk with you through hard times of life. And so if you think you would like somebody to walk with you through something, um, pray with you, maybe meet a few times, that can take on a lot of different forms. But they'll be over here at this table after the service and would love to talk with you about that. Okay? So those are things we want to let you know about. And now uh, let's begin to worship. As we begin, I want to read for you um, from Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah writes, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet. And with two he flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Let's pray. God, this morning we come, and we come to worship you our holy God. And so, God, we pray that you would help us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. I pray that you guys are ready to worship a holy, holy, holy God. Will you stand to your feet and let's praise him. Let's sing. Here you go. Let's say here we go. There's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. Once you choose it, you can lose it. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. 
wonderful. I've got a heart overflowing because I've been restored. There ain't nothing going to steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing going to steal my joy. When the valleys that I wandered turn to mountains that I can't climb, you are with me. Steal my joy. I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I've got a heart overflowing because I've been restored. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. Oh, fuck. Singing in my soul, I got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I've got a heart overflowing that's been restored. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna Keep going, come on. Breathing. Here we go. 
if this is your story, what we're going to sing right now is think of the salvation that God has brought to us through Jesus Christ, all right? I needed rescue. Let's sing. Here we go. Go ahead and have a seat. Um, as we sing that song, you talk about running out of the grave. It reminds me of Ephesians chapter two, where it says, "But you were dead in your trespasses and sins because of what you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked." And so there's that death. But then you get down to verse four. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, made us alive together with Christ. And so it's in. Jesus Christ, it's through his salvation that we are made alive. But then we realize that we, we run out of the day, darkness and we run into his glorious day out of the darkness, but we still live in a fallen world. And so there, there, um, life is still hard. Death is still coming, but it's not an eternal death. It's a death that is a passing into the presence of our Lord. And with that in mind, I do want to tell you um, that Don Byers passed away on Friday morning. Boyers, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Don. <laughs> so Don Byers is perfectly fine. Don. I kept telling myself not to do that, and that's probably what happened there. Um, but Don Boyers, um, who would sit over here with his wife, Maggie, uh, they were good friends with the Alexanders, uh, but he'd struggled for a long time with bone cancer and was really in a tremendous amount of pain. I think this still did come a little faster than they expected. And so um, if you would pray for uh, Maggie, his wife, I know they have at least one son, Nathan, and... Um, just, just pray for them as they miss their husband and dad, okay? We don't have any information on services or anything like that. Uh, I've been told uh, by somebody that they thought they might not do anything, but as that comes, as that information comes, we'll be sure to get that to you, okay? Um, now, our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 32, and this is a psalm that David wrote after his sin with Bathsheba, after Nathan the prophet comes and confronts him. And this is what David writes. He says, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the summer heat. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not count did not cover over my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer a prayer to you at the time when you may be found. Surely in the gush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. 
I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with a bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but the steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we come and we recognize what blessing comes from being forgiven, what blessing comes from having our sins covered. God, what a blessing it is, what joy, what happiness comes in knowing that our iniquity has been kept away. And so, Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness that you bring. And God, we pray that you would help us not to be like David in the fact when, when he sinned, Lord, he hid it for almost a year, God. And he tells us here that his bones wasted away, his, his body ached, Lord, because he was separated from you, Lord. Your, your hand was heavy on him. And God, we pray that we would be a people that doesn't run from you in our sin, Lord, but that we would repent quickly, that we would find your grace, that we would find your forgiveness. No, Lord, we know, we know we will find your grace and forgiveness when we repent, but Lord, we pray that we would respond to our sin very quickly. God, we pray that we would be a people that hates sin, that we would battle it in our hearts, that we would battle it in our minds, God, that we would honor and glorify you in everything that, that we do, Lord. Help us not to be like that stubborn horse or that stubborn mule who just acts by, by their natural instincts, Lord, but help us to live the reality of who we are Lord, those of us that have put our faith in you, we are your children. We are a new creation. And God, we need your help to live like it. God, for those that are here that maybe haven't put their faith in you, Lord, God, I pray that they would see the depth of their sin, that they would put their faith in you, that they would run to you where they can find steadfast love. And God, this morning, we do want to pray for Maggie Boyers, Lord, as she misses Dawn. Um, God, I know that her grief is great, but Lord, we know your comfort and compassion is greater, Lord. So we pray you would pour that on her and on her son, Nathan, Lord. God, we just pray that you would comfort that family. And God, we are, while well, one time sad, also comforted to know that Dawn is experiencing life with you face to face, the pain of cancer gone, the, the pain of this life gone, the battle with sin gone, Lord. He has arrived and is enjoying that. So, Lord, we just, we glory in that and pray that you would remind Maggie uh, of that as well and that that would be a comfort to her. Lord, we pray for um, Stephen Har, uh, Richard and Kathy's son, as he's had heart issues this week and really just gone through a lot. Lord, we pray you would heal his body quickly, that he would recover and that the doctors would um, be able to, to do what they need to do so that doesn't happen again. And Lord, I recognize that there are a lot of other things going on in this church. There are a lot of people struggling with pain and with health issues, Lord. And God, we pray that you would help us. Help us, God, not so that we can be comfortable, but help us, God, so that we can glorify you, so that we can sing your praises, Lord. Because God, we know that you are a steadfast love. And Lord, we know that you are righteous and you are good. And we want to shout for joy to you. And it's in your son's name we pray, amen.
Let's continue to worship our wonderful heavenly Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.
Kids, why don't you guys come forward? We're going to have our kids' message here. That was a good last song, wasn't it? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. You know, there's a guy in the Bible... And we're looking at his, we're looking in his book right now. His name is Paul. And he wrote these, he wrote these letters to these churches. And he was always reminding them to always focus their eyes on Jesus Christ. Right? He was always, he was always reminding them to focus their eyes on Christ. Because he was worthy of everything that they had. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you here like to run a race? You guys like to race? You guys like to race brother and sister, friends, cousins, yeah? Okay, now I need everybody to stand up here on this, up here. Everybody stand up here, okay? Everyone stand up here. Everyone face up forward right here. Okay, everyone stand up. Okay, now show me how you get ready for your race. When they say, on your mark, and everyone's running like that, all right? Now where's your eyes? Where are your, where are your eyes looking? Ahead. Ahead. You guys are good, hey. They're good racers, huh? Yeah, awesome. All right, have a seat. Now, have you ever done? Have you ever every? Have you ever seen somebody race this way? Like, if if the race was going that way, and they go, okay, on your mark, get set, go, and they start running, and they go, oh no, wait, but I want to go back this way. Yeah. You ever see them turn around? Yeah, that's that's not right, right? 
Now, will anybody win the race if they're running the wrong way or focus their eyes somewhere else besides where they're supposed to be running? Unless you're Wiley Coyote and the Road Runner, you can't do that because they run like this. Or like Lightning McQueen, he just races backwards. Yeah, he sometimes he does in the movie. Yeah. Oh, Mater. He learned that from Mater. Look at these guys. They're so, they're so knowledgeable. I need to go brush up. I need to go watch the movie. But usually when people race, when they race, they run in the right direction, focusing their eyes on what? What's up ahead? And what's usually up ahead? The what? Say that loud. Ready? The finish line. The finish line is right up ahead. I heard a story one time of a guy who ran a marathon. He was looking at the wrong sign, and he saw an arrow to the right, and he took a right. He was winning the marathon. He took a right, but he was supposed to go straight. Oh, man. He took himself out of first place. Such a bummer. That's why it's always important to look ahead and know what you're looking for. Paul was a man, like I said, he wanted people to focus their eyes on Christ. And this is what he writes about doing that. Here, hold on. Philippians 3. Pastor, Pastor Rick is going uh, to preach more about this later. So I hope you guys are listening to the message, all right? You guys take notes on your, on your um, kids' worksheet. But he says this. He says, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. He hasn't received it yet. He hasn't gotten it yet. He says, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my, my goal the prize promised by, the God, by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Paul was saying, he says, you know what? There's a lot I've accomplished in my life. There's a lot I have done. But you know what? I consider that, and as we've said the whole, the last couple weeks, he considered it all rubbish. He goes, I forget everything of that because that doesn't worth, that's, that doesn't, it's not worth anything. What I do is I forget everything that's in the past and I focus on what's ahead. And God, not just God, but God wants us to focus on what's ahead. What's the song we just sang? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. See, Paul's goal was to become more like Christ. Because he knew that one day, because he put his life and salvation in Jesus Christ, he was going to one day see Jesus Christ. And as followers, as believers in, in Jesus, we should always be reminded that one day that we're going to get to that heavenly goal. Right now, God wants to make us more and more Christ-like. But one day, we're going to reach that goal in that heaven, and we're going to see Jesus face to face. And we want to see him, and we're going to say, yes, Jesus, we ran the race. So my encouragement to you, to all of us, is that we run the race. We forget the former things of the past, and we look forward to Jesus Christ and becoming more like him. Can we do that, guys? Yes. Can, you have, can you help our church do that? Church, can we help them do this? Yes. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for these young ones, Lord. I thank you for the faith that they, they possess. Thank you that you can speak to even uh, these, these young ones, God. We know that your spirit is alive and well and is working in the hearts of many we pray, God, that you would bring them, bring people to a life-saving knowledge, Lord. I pray that, that you would work in these young ones, the salvation, and Lord, that they would pursue Christ, and we would all pursue Christ and, 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 and focus on you as our goal. Lord, be with us now as we continue to worship you through, through the word, God. We pray, Jesus, that you would open our hearts and teach us what it be, means to be more like you. For it's your name we pray all these things, and everybody said, amen. amen. Thank you, guys. You guys are awesome. Yes, it is. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 16 this morning. And um, I know you guys love me and you care for me, and so you want to correct me when I make errors. And so don't worry, Sabina already corrected me. Um, the Hars do not have a son named Steve. <laughs> Their son is named Scott. So if you caught that in the prayer, Sabina already corrected me. But I know that they would appreciate your prayers for their son, Scott. And I know that his name is Scott because I talked, I went and asked Richard before the service, how's Scott doing? So, yeah, I don't know. So, rough morning for me, all right? But hey, we are going to look at uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16 this morning. And 
In this paragraph, Paul is going to be making reference to a running race. That's what he has in mind as he writes this passage is the idea of running a race. And, and Paul obviously enjoys athletics because he, he loves to use athletics as an illustration uh, in different books that he's written. And today what he's going to be looking at is this idea of running a race. And last week we talked about in verses 8 through um, 11 the fact that Paul had counted everything that he had as loss for the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ. And that what he was reaching for was the righteousness that comes from Christ, realizing that on his own, he could never be righteous. And so he says everything that he had before is worth nothing. It doesn't matter um, where he was born, what his parents were, what kind of education he had, how good he had been. All of that is lost because none of that will give him the righteousness that he needs. He needs the righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And that is an amazing truth that not only does God forgive us, but he gives us Christ's righteousness. But I think Paul understands how people think. I think he understood how the church in Philippi thinks, and I think he probably understands how we think, that if someone comes to me and says, you have Christ's righteousness, then there's a tendency to say, oh, good. Now I don't have to do anything because I have Christ's righteousness. And so in this next paragraph, what you're going to see is Paul encouraging the church to work hard to strive to be like Christ. Because here's the reality of what happens. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are made righteous. You're given a position of righteousness. So God looks at you and sees you as being righteous, but there's still that process of becoming more like Christ. So I have the position of righteousness, but I still need to work on that in my everyday life. And so that's what we see in this paragraph is Paul really encouraged them to pursue Christ, to pursue being like Christ in all that they do. And so let me read this for you. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. Paul says, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. This is God's holy and perfect word for us this morning. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge to be more like you, to pursue one thing. And God, we recognize we need your help in doing that. So Lord, we pray for your help. We pray you would take this passage and help it to shape and change our hearts. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So the first thing I want to talk about this morning is why we run. In verse 12, Paul says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect. But what is he talking about? Obtaining what? What is it that he wants to obtain? And then he says, I'm obtain this or I'm already perfect. So I think you see here that he's, there's a temptation towards perfectionism. There's a temptation for people to say, well, I've, I've received Christ's righteousness, so therefore I'm perfect. And some of you may have even come out, come out of churches that teach perfectionism. There are a few churches that teach that once, once you become a believer, you can obtain perfectionism, or you can per obtain perfection, and where you might make a mistake here and there, you never sin. That's just not true. The fact is that we need to continue to try to be more like Christ. So when we, Paul talks about obtaining this, what is he talking about? He's talking about being conformed to the image of Christ, becoming like Christ. If you go over to Romans chapter 8, you will see that he says the same thing to the church there. This, this idea that we're supposed to be conformed to be like Christ. If you look at 8, Romans 8, 28, it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. And we hear that verse all the time, but what is the good? What is it that, what is the good 
that everything is working towards. Well, if you continue to read, he says in verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might by be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So there's, once, once you're a believer, you will be glorified. But the key there is what he says in verse 29, to be conformed to the image of his son. God saved you to be conformed, to become like Jesus, to begin to look like him. If you are, if you've put your faith in him, you become his child and you should start to look like your heavenly father. Keep your thumb there because we're going to go right back to Romans in a second. But so when Paul talks about obtaining this, that's what he's talking about obtaining. I haven't obtained Christ likeness yet. And he says, not that I've attained this or I'm already perfect. Now, Paul's writing Philippians 30 years after the Damascus Road. So he's 30 years into his Christian walk. He's writing this kind of letter. He is a mature believer. I think it, when I look at Scripture and think, of, is there anyone that I really admire? It's Paul. I mean, Paul seems to get it. I mean, he's mature. 30 years in, he's going, I, I still, I haven't obtained this. And so that's what we're, we're running to be like Jesus. And we're running because Christ Jesus has made us his own. Why do I want to be like Christ? Because Christ has made me his own. He's, he's saved me. He's chosen me. He's made me his child. And this is an amazing truth that God, all-powerful, all-knowing, almighty, eternal, omnipresent, glorious, righteous, holy, made you his. And the alternative is to not, to, the alternative to belonging to Christ is to belong to yourself, to be your own, on your own, with no grace, no help, no mercy. And so we run because that's the logical response to what Christ has done for us. Over in Romans chapter 12, in verse 1, you have Romans 1 through 11. Is, it's really the theological part of the book. And then in verse 12, he basically says, because of everything I've just told you, here's how you live your life. And this is how he begins the, the whole section. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And that spiritual worship could be translated, which is your logical worship. So it's the logical thing to do to present your body a living sacrifice to God. And then verse 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So what Paul writes there in Romans 12 is, the logical response to being saved by God is to be conformed, to be transformed, to look like him. And that's what he's getting at here in Philippians, is we run because he saved us. That's why we run, because we're his. We run because we haven't obtained Christ-likeness yet. We're not there yet, and so we have to run. So then how do we run? Look at verse 13. It says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, so we run with one purpose. We run with the purpose of making Christ's likeness ours. We run to be like Christ. That's how we run. We run with one purpose. And we have to recognize that we haven't attain, obtained it yet. F.B. Myers said, self-dissatisfaction, get that self-dissatisfaction so you're not satisfied with yourself. Self-dissatisfaction self lies at the root of of our noblest achievements. Self-dissatisfaction lies at the root of our noblest achievements. And we live in a world that tells us, don't ever be dissatisfied with yourself. You're fine. But think through your own life. It's dissatisfaction with ourself that drives us to do more, to be better. Whether it's a better husband, better parent, 
better employee, to gain more knowledge, go back to school, be a better student. All of that comes from realizing that we haven't achieved what we would like to achieve and what maybe we believe we could achieve. The same thing's true of our spiritual life. As a Christian, we should never be satisfied with where we are with God. Because the reality is that God is so much bigger than us, we will never know him in totality. So to be satisfied with where we are with God is to say, eh, I know enough of God. You don't. There is so much more. And I know it's hard for us to fathom, but I think the joy of heaven is being in God's presence, and the joy of heaven is continually to learn about him. And the amazing part of eternity is you will learn about him and never fully know him. You'll know him, you'll know him well, but there will always be more because that's who God is. And so we run with one purpose, to be like Christ. We realize that we haven't made it our own. And we run with one passion. Paul says, there's one thing I do. This is a singleness of mind. He's like, this is my passionate thing. This is what I'm about. This is what I do. I think it was about a decade ago, you would hear all the time, follow your passion. Follow your passion. People were always saying that. And the idea was to follow what you love. Um, it's good in theory, but sometimes, you know, what you love won't feed you. Like, I, if, if you've been around here a little bit, you know, I, I love baseball. My goal from childhood was to be a professional baseball player. It didn't even pay for my college. <laughs> if I would have followed what I loved, I'd be really hungry. I probably wouldn't be married, probably wouldn't have kids. I mean, there just comes a point where you have to go, okay, but that's, that's not what God is calling us to here. When Paul says, one thing I do, he's not calling you to follow what you love. He's calling you to follow who you love. The one thing we are to do is to be like Christ, which comes from knowing Christ. The Bible, and, and we see that, you go back to verse 8, and Paul says, indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And then you go on, he says in the same verse, for this sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Not gain riches, not gain anything. I want to gain Christ. So he says the surpassing worth is knowing Christ. I want to gain Christ. And then you get down to verse 10. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And then in verse 12 that we just read, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. The one thing we do is not to be moral. It's not to, it's, it's not to just do good things. The one thing we do is to pursue Christ a relationship with Christ, and then everything else falls in line behind that because of our love for Christ. Marriage is used as an illustration um, through Scripture for Christ's love for the church. And I'm married to Sabina. Sabina is to be my one thing in marriage. When you get married, you say you will renounce all others for, this, for her and marriage isn't about a tax break. It's not about having a bigger house. It's not about having kids. Marriage is about loving Sabina, if you're me, <laughs> right? And that, that, I, that's what I'm called to do. My one thing in marriage is a person. It's not an institution. I, was it Mae West that said, I believe marriage is a great institution, but I'm not ready for an institution? Marriage isn't an institution. It's a relationship with a person, and when we think about our relationship with God, Christianity isn't an institution or a religion. It's a relationship with God. And so the passion that Paul runs with is a passion to do one thing. It's to know one person. And he says that he forgets. He says, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to lie, what lies ahead so Paul says, I'm all about this one thing, knowing, being like Christ. 
and everything else behind doesn't matter. James Montgomery Boyce, I think, explains this really well. He says, what is the nature of forgetting then? It is the kind of forgetting that occurs when we cease to let the things in the past overshadow the present, and it lets the past be the past, both the good and the bad, and it constantly looks forward to the work God has for us. I've heard people say that, you know, forgetting what lies behind just means you should forget your past. Well, the fact is, your past is where you get a lot of your wisdom. The fact is that the past, the the mistakes we've made and the good things we do are what has shaped us to be like today, who we are today. But they don't define us. And so, on the one hand, our past sins don't define us and we don't live in fear of those. And on the other hand, our past good deeds don't define us. We're to be pushing forward to the future. And so you may say, well, what does that mean? Well, it may mean that, you know, sometimes you, you know, be talking to somebody and ask them to share their testimony and they'll talk about, well, you know, I've put my faith in Christ and I was in this church and 20 years ago I did this and I did this and I did this and I did this. Well, that's great, but what are you doing now? Again, being an athlete and just kind of the pride and arrogance that comes with athletes, it, it, would, it would just always bug me. I was going to say us, but it bugged me, but I think other guys too, but mainly me. When guys would say, oh yeah, I did this, 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 and this, and we had a saying, what have you done for me lately? I don't care how many home runs you hit last year. What are you going to do for this team this year? So for us as Christians, we need to forget our past sins. Those don't define us. But our past good works don't define us either. We're to be pushing forward, being about one thing, always striving to know Christ more, to look more like him, to live for him. Uh, The Israelites in the book of Numbers, they get out in the desert and they're starving and God provides manna for them. And they're so excited for the manna, right? And they're just, this is God's blessing on us. And they go out and they receive it with joy. And it it is God delivering food for them in a very, very real way. It is God saying, you are my people. I will take care of you. And then you get to chapter 11. And they're looking back to Egypt. And they say, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. (laughs) Nothing but manna. It was God's reminder every day, I'm taking care of you, I'm taking care of you. But when we look to the past... Some, it, the past is always distorted when you look back. You'll look back on past sins and think it was good. Be like, I was happy then. And then you have to stop and go, actually, I wasn't really. And so the past distorts, or the past becomes distorted when we look back. And we always have to be pushing forward, remembering what God has done for us. God has saved us. God has given us the blessing of Jesus Christ. And so we are pushing forward. So we run with one purpose, we run with one passion, and we run for one prize. Verse 14 says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We cannot lose sight of the goal. We cannot become distracted. We want the upward call. We want what God is calling us to. And the upward call is salvation. In 1 Corinthians 1.26, Paul says, For consider your calling, brothers. And he goes on and says, Not many of you were wise, not many of you were all these things. But he says, Consider your calling. He's talking about salvation. 1 Corinthians 7.20, Each of you should remain in the condition in which you were called. Talking about salvation. Ephesians 1.18, That you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? So the calling is a call to salvation, and it's a call to be changed and sanctified to be like Christ, because 
here's, here's the reality is you can say you're called by Christ, you can say you're a Christian, but if there's not a corresponding change in the way that you live, there's really reason to doubt whether you have truly been made a new creation and a new creature. Ephesians 4, 1 says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 and 12, Paul says, to this end we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our goal is to be like Christ, to chase one prize, Jesus Christ. And when we say that there's one goal and we're chasing one prize, there's an assumption made there, and I don't want to assume, so let me just tell you flat out that the assumption is that Jesus, knowing Christ, is better than anything else the world has to offer. That, that, and that's what Paul spent the first part of the chapter talking about, right? Everything that he had, he says, that, that's loss. It's rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ. But our hearts, our passions, our desires may sometimes question that. And so we go back to verse 7 and 8 where he says, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. For the sake of Christ, indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. We have to constantly be reminding ourselves of that, constantly telling ourselves of that, because things will creep up and say, hey, I'm worth, I'm worth something. And we have to say, you're nowhere near worth what Christ is worth. And so we need to be talking to ourselves and reminding ourselves of that all the time. The one prize that we strain for is Jesus Christ. And then let's talk about who we run with. In verse 15, Paul says, let those who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So a mature Christian pursues one thing. The longer you walk with the Lord, the more single-minded you become. And I think it's just, it's part of that working out your faith with, um, working out your salvation with fear and trembling that Paul talked about back in chapter 2, verse 12, is that the longer you're a believer, the more you realize that all those other things in the world that say they're worth something aren't. And so we become more single-minded, and, and God's working on us. He's, he's molding us and shaping us. He's helping us to be more single-minded. And so Paul says, if you're mature, you'll think this way. You will think there's one thing to pursue. Nothing else is worth as much as knowing Christ. And he says, and if you don't think that way, God will reveal that to you. So he's telling us here that God, if you're a believer, God is going to work in your life, and God is going to change you and help you to become single-minded. That should be a amazing, huge, gigantic blessing to you. Because I know, I, I think a lot of us are like, yeah, I, I get what Paul's saying, one thing I do, but that's Paul. I'm me. I'm ordinary. But that's who Christ calls, right? Ordinary people. Doing ordinary things for his glory to call people to him. And he says, so you know what? If you don't think this way, don't worry. God will reveal it to you. And how does God reveal it to you? Through the Bible. Read his word. Let him show you what the attitude of a Christian looks like. That the fruit that a Christian develops is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. And as you read those things, God starts to reveal where we're not as single-minded as we should be. He reveals it through preaching. I, uh, there are often times where people come to me and they're like, man, you were preaching right to me today. And I'm grateful for that, but I, I honestly, I don't know that. 
I, I, and honestly, I, I don't know that I've ever preached a sermon thinking, hey, that person needs to hear that. Um, I had an old pastor that he would just say, hey, I'm shooting in a barrel, and if you happen to be down in there... <laughs> but as, and, and I say preaching, but really what it is, is it's as we gather together as the church... Because God reveal, uses his word to reveal where we need to become more like him. And as his word is read and his wor- as his word is expounded upon and as his word is played out in your lives as you talk to each other and as you get to know each other. And at the end of the service, we're going to welcome new members into our church. And what I told them in the new member class was if you want to get involved in Woodward Park Baptist Church, don't wait for us to start a program you like. Just start having people over for dinner, going to lunch with them, having them over for coffee, or just staying late for 45 minutes and talking. That's fine. That's what we want to be because that's what God called. That's how God reveals to us where we need to grow is he uses the church where we're... We're the iron that's supposed to sharpen each other. And then the Holy Spirit is working through all of these things. And so oftentimes I think that that's what's happened in my life is I read something and just kind of, and then a day or two later the Holy Spirit's like, yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, I did read that, huh? And then another day later, yeah. The Holy Spirit is constantly working through all of these things to show us how we need to change to be more like Christ. And so God God is our coach, God's our partner, God's our helper, God's our comforter in this race. He's the one that's going to help us, but we need to recognize that this is how a mature Christian thinks. I'm about one thing, knowing Christ. And then how long must you run for? Verse 16, only let us hold true to what we have attained. How long do we hold for? He doesn't say when to stop, does he? He just says, only let us hold true to what we have attained. So when we put our faith in Christ, Christ makes us righteous. We hear the gospel, we love Christ, and we just hold on to him as tightly as we can until he brings us to glory and makes us realize our righteousness. Christ likeness is our goal through this entire life, but we won't achieve it until we're in glory with Christ. And so we are to hold fast to the end. I want to finish by telling you about someone. Um, his name is Giannis Kors. He holds the record for the Spartathlon and for several ultra marathons. A Spartathlon is a 153 mile race from Athens to Sparta. And the Athenian runners were sent to Sparta to ask for help against the invading Parisians. Persians, Parisians, Persians. <laughs> um, and he holds the top four times in that race, 153 miles. The record is 20 hours and 25 minutes. Before you do the math, that's an eight minute, four second mile for 153 miles. He also holds many other records. He holds the 100-mile road record, which he did in 11 hours, 46 minutes, and 37 seconds. He holds the 12-hour road, which you just run for 12 hours to see how far you can go, and he covered 100.95 miles. He holds the 24-hour record, in which he covered 180.26 miles. He holds the 24-hour track record, in which he ran 188.5 miles. He holds the 48-hour road record in which he ran 269 miles. He holds the 48-hour track record in which he ran 249 miles. He holds the record for the Sydney to Melbourne race, which he ran in five days, five hours, seven minutes, and six seconds. I don't know why you go to seconds in that race, but... (laughs) And when somebody asked him the secret to his running, this is what he said... When other people get tired, they stop. I don't. That should be the testimony of every Christian. Beloved, when you get tired, don't stop. Keep pushing. Be about one thing, pursuing Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the salvation that we can know through Jesus Christ. 
We thank you that you don't leave us in our trespasses and sins, but you give us freedom through Jesus Christ. You give us life through Jesus Christ. And God, I pray that you would help us to be more like Christ. You promise that you will, and God, I pray that you would just help us to submit to you, to grow to be more like you as individuals and as a church. And God, I pray for anyone here that doesn't know you, that they don't have a relationship with you, that they don't know for sure what will happen after they die. God, I pray you would work in their heart. I pray that you would wrestle with them, that you would make them aware of their sin, and that you would bring them to salvation this morning. God, again, we love you. We thank you for the privilege of being your children. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. We're going to sing one more song. And if you don't know Christ, I would love to talk with you either during this song, I'll be here at the front or grab me afterward. Um, There'll be some people up here to pray with you as well if you'd like somebody to pray with you, okay? Why don't you stand and we'll sing. i
God good? Amen. Why don't you have a quick seat? We thank you for being here at church. We pray that you've been encouraged in the word, through, uh, through the message, through the worship, uh, encouraged to, to pursue Christ and Christ's likeness in, in your lives. Uh, there's a couple of things we want to make you aware of in the way of announcements, which are, if you have a connection card uh, in, your, in your worship guide, you receive the connection card. And if you're a first time guest, visitor, uh, new person, old person, uh, whatever it is, and uh, we'd just like to have a record of your visit with us today. So fill it out, drop it off in the basket as you exit the door. If there's any, uh, any way we can uh, pray for you, please indicate that on, on the card. Um, it, we pray for those on a weekly basis during our staff meeting. And if there's any information you'd like to know about the church, about anything going on in the church, uh, becoming uh, a Christian, more like Christ, things that are going on, please indicate that and we can get that information to you as quickly as possible. Uh, just help us out by filling that out and putting that in the basket. All right.